In the northern part of the kingdom west, this is where Lion's Gate lies. Here the bird sings outside his nest as he greets the morning sunrise. In Lion's Gate, neath the tall fir trees, on your face feel the ocean breeze. Feel the magic that's in the air in Lion's Gate, the fair. Court to the cloud, it is. That's now cool. recording. Woo! Thank you, Jere. Greetings all. Mistress Sigrid, Sigridus Gala, Eric's daughter, or Doti, Doti, has been part of the SCA since 1997 and quickly became a mover and shaker within TRE. She received her award of arms in 2005 and then many more awards until her laurel in 2015. Her areas of interest include illumination, calligraphy, tablet weaving and cooking, but most especially bardic. She is a professional musician and actor. And within the SCA, she is a founding member of the Antir Players, but specializes in Scandinavian medieval folk music, especially balladry. She is a former Bardic champion of Antir, Tiri, and Lionsdale, with her first Bardic comp uh, championship from my own barony, Lionsgate. Aww. Gala is also the current Kingdom Arts and Science Minister and past Antir. AS, ANS Bardic Championship Deputy. That's a mouthful. As such, she has seen, seen a lot of documentation and research papers, both good and not so good. As such, she would like to share her knowledge and tips on how to create good documentation for your ANS or Bardic entries into future competitions. So here is a truly savage daughter gala. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> that wasn't quite what I wrote, but I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. I'm Mr. Gala. Don't worry about the rest of the jumble of soup that comes before and after my name. Just call me Gala. Um, I don't really have to say much of anything else since Kinnerk just said it all. Um, but uh, I will say, yes, I am the ANS Minister of Ontier, and uh, I have been running the ANS competition in Ontier and in Thierry um, for a number of years. And um, because all of the documentation for each of those competitions comes through my desk, I get to see it all. Um, and that includes research papers, which is a completely different kettle of fish, which I will only briefly touch on tonight um, because we're here to talk about documentation. Now, um, I know most of you have your cameras off right now, but if maybe you could type in the chat or something like how many of you have actually done documentation uh, before? Or you can put your hands up. Those I can see, yes. <laughs> Tiny little bit, says Jure. Okay. Um, and you have somebody who says a university degree. So you, you know what you're doing then. Okay. So the purpose of this class is partly to dispel some myths um, that some people seem to have about what is expected when it comes to documentation, what they think that we, the Laurel or, or judges and or judges are expecting, as opposed to what we actually are expecting. And the two of those things are very often very, very different. Um, the myth is that we as laurels and judges are expecting to see a 50 page long dissertation uh, on the subject of whatever it is that you're doing, when in fact that is not the case at all. Yes, there are some eggheads among us, like myself and perhaps Zoe, um, or sorry, Kiva, uh, who are, are just generally eggheads and like writing stuff and like uh, researching, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a lot to say. That does not mean that you have to do the same. Uh, we will cover exactly what needs to be covered in your documentation. And I will say this right from the out get. If you can cover all of that in two pages, that is good enough. If you need to take 50 pages to do it, okay, you might want to consider doing a research paper as opposed to documentation. Um, but if you can do it in two, that is absolutely good enough. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So first off, I'm going to go to my outline. Um, if I can share screen here a minute, maybe. Oh, Dre, you're going to have to give me a control so I can do that. Thank you. All right, where am I at? 
Mm. And then here. Oop, done. Okay. I want this one. Oop. Okay. So, first of all, what is documentation? So documentation to me, and, and I also would like to say too that for the others in here, uh, particularly the laurels that are in here, if you wanna jump in and add stuff, please do. Um, I would appreciate that as a matter of fact, um, because we all have different perspectives and I'd like other in input. So what is documentation? Documentation to, to me is you telling us as either the laurels or judges or anybody who might be looking at your display on your table, what exactly it is that you are doing, both the historical context of whatever, whatever it is you're doing and what you actually did. So it encompasses quite a lot, but really it should be a, a snapshot of here's the project that I'm working on, here's how it worked out or didn't work out, that's also okay. Um, and that's what it is, that's your purpose is to tell us what it is that you're doing. So why do we do it? Again, it's to tell us what we're doing. It's to tell other people who might come by and look at your thing, but it's also a bit of a legacy too. So particularly if you're doing something that is um, something that somebody else may not have ever seen before. You're doing completely different uh, research than anyone else has done. It might be a topic that's totally different that nobody else has done. And there's not a lot of information out there. That means your documentation then becomes a legacy for other people coming behind you um, to use your already research, just as we already use other people's research um, going forward. So for instance, a few years ago, I entered um, a couple of pieces in Kingdom Bardic um, which were, one was a Sami yoik uh, and one was um, Swedish cow calling or kulning, neither one of which there are anybody else in Ontario that are doing at that time. I don't know, there might be now, but at that time there wasn't. So my research for the next person coming down the line who goes, I think I want to look up cow calling. Well, there's not a lot of information out there on cow calling. So they can start by using my research. My research will tell them else other research to go and look at. So there is a legacy to doing documentation. It's not just uh, because you have to for a competition, um, et cetera. So that's what documentation is or should be. Does anybody else have any thoughts they wanna to add to that? Yes, no? I think that makes it lovely and concise. Cool, all right. So myth busting. Laurels and judges expect to see 50 page thesis papers. Quick answer, no, we do not. Um, we absolutely do not. Part of that is because we don't need 50 pages to know what it is that you know. Um, you can tell us that in two pages. You can tell us that in five pages, uh, 50 pages. When you see a 50 page long bit of documentation, what you're actually probably seeing is not that much writing. And then a whole long thing of appendices and bibliography and photographs and et cetera, et cetera, that pad that out and make it really long. So you're probably not seeing what you think you're seeing when you see 50 pages coming out of people. Um, I know that there are some of the examples I have in here, which I'll show you um, are quite long. You know, they might be 26 or 30 pages long, but the vast majority of that is pictures of extant pieces, pictures of supporting documentation, pictures of the person's process in making the thing that they were making. Um, et cetera, and, and then bibliography, citations, et cetera. So the actual writing portion of it was really not all that long, but there was a lot of supporting photographs and that makes it seem a lot longer than it is. And, and I will say that photographs are a very, very important part of your documentation. We're gonna talk about that. Myth number two, I have to do this all on my own when it comes to doing your documentation. Quick answer, no, you do not. You can, in fact, have other people help you with your documentation. If you are no good at writing, have somebody help you write. If you are no good at formatting, have someone format for you. If you can't proofread, and you probably shouldn't proofread your own, I mean, run through it a few times yourself, but then pass it off to someone else to proofread, have someone else proofread it. Um, if you don't know how to do citations, have somebody help you with doing citations or how to properly put together a bibliography or, I just really don't know how to organize this. Please help me organize it. You can have other people help you with your documentation. It is not a solo act. Okay. 
I can or C, I cannot enter a failed project in a competition. So a lot of the times we think that we can't enter a thing unless it was absolutely perfect. Um, and in fact, sometimes things don't work out perfectly at all. Sometimes they're complete failures from what you set out to do. And that's okay because you can enter, not only can you enter it as a process um, piece, which basically means the only thing I'm entering this is in this is not the actual end product, but the process of how I got to where this end product was. And that end product may or may not have been a success depending on what you started out to do. Um, so it is absolutely okay to have a failed project entered in a competition. It doesn't have to be perfect. And if I, if I can interject, you sometimes yeah. learn a lot more from a failed project than mm -hmm. from one that went smoothly to be boo. Absolutely. That is absolutely true. And I've actually seen many people who have started off to do one thing um, and then discovered that that thing didn't work the way they, they did it or the way they wanted to do it, but they ended up with something else that was completely unexpected. And so they've entered that thing. Um, and some of those have become some of the best projects we've seen simply because there's, you can see that process of, of the thinking, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, of trying different things. And that's particularly true when it comes for like, let's say uh, a dying project. Um, you may have sat, set out to try and recreate this particular color, but unexpectedly something else completely different happened. And hey, that was a really happy accident. What happens if I do this now? So you end up then with a completely different project from what you started off with. That doesn't mean that it was a failed project. So you can still enter that kind of thing. The last myth I wanna talk about really quickly, and that is the most important one <laughs> for this particular class in particular, and that is documentation is best left to do at the end of your project. Quick answer is no, it is not. <laughs> Um, you should, in fact, actually start your documentation the day that you decide you're going to do a particular project. Your documentation starts that day. And so, where do you begin then? So, you've picked your project, so now where do you go? So, obviously, you're going to have to do some research, and you should be absolutely be researching whatever it is you're doing before you have ever started anything else, before you've cut your wood, before you've put even a stitch, into your your dress that you're making um, before you've played a note on the piece that you're wanting to present. You need to research this piece. And there's lots of things you need to research. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, but quickly, we want to talk about finding your resources. So nowadays, of course, we have the internet. So finding resources for things is a whole lot easier than it was, say, 30 years ago. Uh, when 30 years ago, you only had access to the library or the library system um, or talking to other people or the books you might have on your shelf or that you could beg, borrow and steal from other people um, or buy. Nowadays, we have this fantastic thing called the Internet where we can get a whole lot more information than we used to be able to get. Um, but that also can make things a little more difficult, too, because there's so much information out there and that information might not always be correct. So you do have to be careful about what you are using as your sources um, and cross-referencing things with other sources. So particularly um, uh, talking about Wikipedia. Now I know there's gonna be some people in here all like, yeah, Wikipedia is the greatest thing. Wikipedia is a great thing, don't get me wrong. But Wikipedia is very valuable in that anybody can edit any Wikipedia page. So if I go in and I put up a page on cow calling, um, anybody else in the entire world can go in and edit that document with whatever information they want to. Uh, and that doesn't have to be cited. It doesn't have to be correct. Um, so you do have to be careful with that. But what Wikipedia is really good for is finding other tangents to go off of. So there might be links at the bottom, there might be resources at the bottom, there might be pictures to follow, there might be links to other pages or other uh, relative information that you go and look at from Wikipedia and then find a whole lot of other information that you might not have thought about. That's the one thing I really like Wikipedia for. But if you're using Wikipedia as your sole source for everything, mm, you might want to rethink that. Um, and judges too will look at that and go, mm, you, need, you need some more better 
uh, sources. Yeah. Um, it okay. a start, but it shouldn't be your sole source. No, this absolutely, like I said, it's a really great jumping off point, but it should not be your main source of information ever. Um, yeah, anybody else want to add to that? Nope. Okay. The same, um, uh, same thing could be said about YouTube. Yes, it's true too. Um, yeah, and as well as for, sorry, I'm just going to take a little drink here. When we're talking about finding resources too, one of the things that you should never ever be afraid to do if you're researching something is to write to a museum or write to a library, uh, send them an email um, and just ask them, you know, do you have any information on X, Y, or Z? Or if you're like me, um, for instance, when I was researching a particular ballad, I happened to know what book it was in, what page it was on, what library it was in. And so I wrote to that library slash museum and said, I'm looking for pictures of this particular book. It's on this shelf on, and it's on this page. Would you be willing to go take some pictures for me? And they went, okay. Um, they were just so excited to have anybody who was interested enough to take the time to do that. They were totally willing to go and um, find that information for me and send me pictures, which was fantastic. You'll be surprised how many times uh, a library or a museum would be help, ha help happy to help you with your research. Um, uh, as another example, we've got Mr. Stisa. Now this is an extreme example. Mr. Stisa, who was going to visit Sweden and wrote to the Swedish Museum, National Museum, and said, I'm really interested in this particular thing, which was possumants at that time. Uh, would it be possible to, to, you know, maybe see a couple of them? Well, they ended up inviting her to go into the back where all of the possumants really are kept, because the few that were on display was just a small portion of them. The rest of them were all in the back. And so they invited her into the back where she was able to photograph and get nose to nose with these things and, and look at them. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen for everybody. What I'm saying is don't be afraid to ask, because uh, what's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to say no. Or... I'm sorry, I don't have time. Well, at least you asked, right? So, and if you don't, then you won't get that information. So don't be afraid to go and ask for the stuff that you're looking for if you can't find it online yourself or in books or whatever. So the next thing you wanna do though, once you've done all your research, you've compiled all your information is you need to distill down what is the relevant information. It's really easy to get off on a tangent of this and a tangent of that, which is not necessarily relevant to the topic for which you are um, actually working on. Um, it might be really interesting, um, maybe to you and maybe nobody else, but, or maybe it might be, but is it relevant to this thing? Is it, is it adding to um, your documentation or is it just taking up space um, that isn't relevant um, and isn't necessary? So it really comes down to, is it necessary to have this information in here for this particular thing that I'm making. If it's necessary, then absolutely leave it in. If it's not, then I would say probably want to leave it out. Or if you really, really feel like it should be in there, maybe make it as a you know post note in an appendices or something of that nature. Anybody else want to add to that? I'm going to keep asking this because I know there's people in here who have lots of experience with documentation. So feel free there, to- There are a number of comments that have mm -hmm. popped up, uh, which you may want to review and, and think, perhaps okay. read out and discuss. Sure. Uh, I can't, well, I'm on share screen, I can't. So would you be able to read those? I would be glad to. Thank you. Um, uh, Tanique pointed out that there's a, uh, a difference between documents and provenance, uh, which is not necessarily the same. Right. And also that she had an awesome experience at the Mary Rose Museum for oh, uh, cool. museum visit. Uh, and Kiba brought up, the, just remember that when approaching men, museums, and you mentioned the SCA, be a good, kind, and respectful representative of the game. Yes, absolutely. Be very specific in your request if you want a quick and concise response. Yeah, if you if you go in there with, uh, I'm looking for information on what's it, um, and it's a huge, big topic, you're probably not going to get as as concise and <laughs> or as much information as you would like. But if you went in and said, I'm looking for information on Skujula Watch at number nine, well, then they can go, mm, okay, number nine, I can find that. Um, yeah, I mean, if it's a huge topic and there's lots of information, you're probably going to be out of luck on that. Maybe not, I don't know. It depends on how bored somebody is at the museum that particular day and how, you know, wants to send lots of information, right? 
Um, but yeah, the more specific you can be on the thing that you're you're um, researching, you more likely you're going to get uh, an answer back. Yes, Kushai. Um, I've always found that this is the part when I'm doing my research that is the most difficult is figuring out what to what bath water to throw out and keep the baby. Right. Yeah, like I said, it, it's it's um, what is relevant to this specific project that you're doing. So like if you are, as an example, um, I'm doing a project on embroidered brustaflex. Okay, so your project is an embroidered brustaflex. I don't really need to know how the entire rest of the of the outfit that went around the brustaflex is made and what material it was and how it was stitched, et cetera. If your project is a Bruce effect, that's what the information that I need. So it's picking what information is actually relevant to what you're doing and necessary to um, put this thing in context or whatever. So it's relevant and necessary as far as I'm like, and Kiva has her hand up. Oop, can't hear you. Sorry, when okay. I'm approaching documentation, I do the same process in terms of, of narrowing things down. So what I do is I, I, I personally like to have a table of contents at the beginning, which lays things out. And so I'll be like, okay, I think I want to talk, like, let's say I'm doing a pair. I did a pair of Roman pants once, um, the Thorsberg trousers. And so I was like, okay, I want to talk about the pattern. So I'll just go, like, I'll start a new page and I'll put pattern. And then I won't even put anything in it. And then I'll go back to my table of contents. Okay, after the pattern, oh, I actually want to talk about the fabric and maybe what some of the tools were. And I kind of build my sections just with like one word on that page. And then as I'm going through later and I'm going through my stuff, my papers or my book books or whatever, I kind of pick and choose, but I'm also trying to address each of those things as minimally as possible and as focused as possible. So really, I think a great documentation is if you have a table of contents and even just one or two paragraphs or even like just even a solid paragraph that you've addressed this one thing that you thought at the beginning was important through the for the flow of it. Like, I think that that's a great way to sort of hang your documentation together. But like short and sweet is the way to go for sure. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I do talk about that, too, when I get down a little bit further about starting with an outline of what you want to talk about, what what's your project about. So we will talk about that in a minute. Um, so once you've kind of distilled down to the re relevant and necessary parts, um, it may still be too big at that point, and you may still want to edit later. But right now, we don't need to worry about editing that stuff out, just, just making sure that you're still focused on what your topic is. Um, I'm just slipping this in here now because it's kind of a good place to, I think, and that is to read the judging forms that are going to be used. If you're entering our competition, that is the best tool that you could possibly use when you're entering that competition. Why? Because that, that judging form, I like to call it your to-do list. So if you use that list, uh, that judging form as a, I need to do all of these things in order to get this score, or these are the things that the judges are looking for, um, then you're much more, you're going to be much more successful. If you don't read the judging form and you don't know what you're going into, you might have some issues. Um, but reading the judging forms really, really does give you quite the insight on into what the judges are looking for, because the judges are looking for what's on that paper. Um, so that's exactly it. Read the judging forms ahead of time before you even start writing your documentation, before you start putting your presentation together, read the judging forms and continually read the judging forms as you go through. Oh, uh, the judges are looking for this on this part of my documentation. Oh, I better go and fix that and, or add this or take that out or whatever. Um, so continually read the judging forms as well. Um, and so, as I said, you've picked your project, you've started doing your research, and now you're gonna actually begin making your project, whatever it is, whether it happens to be a dress or a piece of weaving, or even if you're doing a bardic entry. And I should have said from the beginning too, although I'm talking about a thing or an object in here, most of this will be relevant for bardic as well. Um, it, it, it's transferable, so there you go. So you're gonna begin your project. Um, I always tell people when you start your project before you have even had, before you've cut the wood, before you put a stitch in anything, you want to take a picture of all the materials that you're going to be using. 
and all of the tools that you're going to be using. Those tools don't have to be period. They can be modern tools. You should be able to tell us what the difference is or what they would have been used in period. But take a picture of those things. You have now started your documentation. That's going to be one of probably the first pictures. Here's all the things I use to make this thing. OK. And you're going to document every single step of your process in making this thing. You might not use every single one of those pictures. I mean, you're going to end up with probably hundreds of pictures by the time you're done, but you can choose one that is, you know, shows this particular step of the thing, or, or maybe you're only going to show the very um, most important steps in making this whatever it is. Of course, for Bardic, there's not really a picture process. Um, so you might want to just leave that out. Um, there can be if you are do if you are entering, say, a piece that you have, have uh, taken from a period manuscript to a performable form. Right. Yeah. So it, there is that that way, but like it's not the same as as you know taking a picture of every single process, every different stitch style you've used or anything like that. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that's the beginning of your document of your documentation is taking these pictures and documenting your processes as you go along. Okay, so now I come to writing your documentation. You've compiled all the information. This is the part where you get to show us what your goals were in making this project uh, and what you learned through making this project. Um, also, it's gonna be, and when I say what you learned, that's also part of the, the history of things. What did you learn about this object and about making this object. So here was my goal. Did I reach that goal? Yes. Did I not reach that goal? No. Why did that happen? What, what did I learn through this, including the historicity, 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 historicalness? I don't know. Anyway, um, so you're going to tell us what you learned and how do we do that? Well, we've all heard the you know five W's and the eight, five W's and the H. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? And somebody just walked in my door. Thank you. Um, thanks, mommy. Uh, my mother just brought me dinner. How nice. Um, so what I tell people is that it's not just a case of the cursory who, what, when, where, why. You want to sit down and I, I personally write out a list. I think of all of the different what questions, why questions, how questions, who questions that I can think of. Now, this is not an ex ex exhaustive list here, obviously. Um, but like with the what question, so what is it? That seems like a no brainer. Uh, what was it used for? What was it made from? What's the historical context of this thing? Uh, historical context is especially interesting when it comes to doing bardic stuff, because oftentimes that is relevant, very, very relevant to the bardic stuff. Um, but it can be for objects and things like that as well. What tools were used to make this thing? And there's probably a whole bunch of other what questions I haven't thought of, but the point is to sit and think of all the different what questions you can. Who questions? Who would have used this thing? Who would have made this thing? Who was it made for? Uh, it, was it made because uh, some wealthy patron asked somebody to make this thing? Uh, so, you know, Henry VIII paid an artist to make a painting of him. Or was it made because John's wife needed a spoodle bloodle? Um, and so John went out and made a spoodle bloodle or bought a spoodle bloodle. So who, who would have this, who was it made for? Who would have th this, who would have this thing? That doesn't even make sense. Who would have this thing been most popular with or least popular with? All right, so when, when was it made? When was it in popular use? So was it in use for 700 years or was it in use only for 30 years? Um, uh, when did it fall out of use? Maybe it hasn't. Maybe we're still using that thing today. Where was it from? Where was it most popular? Where can similar objects be found elsewhere? Where would you get these tools to make such a thing? Um, or did you just have them? Did you make your own tools? I don't know. How was it made? How was it used? How far reaching can similar objects or styles be found? How expensive would it have been to produce um, it on your own? How much time did it take? How much training would have been needed? How many people would have been involved in making the components for this whatever it is? 
So there's lots and lots of those who, what, when, where, why questions you can come up with. And as I said, this is not an extensive, or, I mean, exhaustive list here. So do sit down and actually think about some of these questions. Um, and the reason I say that is because somebody is probably going to ask you a question. Uh, if particularly if you haven't covered it in your documentation, somebody's probably going to ask you a question, um, and that might seem out of left field. But if you've already thought of most of the questions that, that they're possibly going to come up with, and you already have an answer ready, whether it's in your documentation or just in your head, um, then you're ahead of the game already. So um, you want to think of as many things that the judges, or even if it's just for a display that somebody in the populace might uh, come by and ask you some question that you hadn't thought of. So try and think of those things. All right. And so, as Kiva said, uh, you want to create an outline. Boy, I have some typos in here. Sorry about that. So you want to create your outline. Um, and as she said, you, you want to go through and figure out what relevant and necessary things you need to talk about in your documentation. And I, I tend to try and make that as separate headings, like Kiva said, um, and, uh, and work from that. That will help you to not run off in various tangents. Um, it's, it still may happen and you may end up having to edit things down and that's fine, but it's, it's a good place to sort of just brainstorm at this point. Here's all the things that I need to talk about or that I want to talk about and then go from there. If you just start writing, you're going to end up with spaghetti that goes in 17 different directions all at once and it will make no sense to anybody. And that's not what you want. You want to make this as easy for people to be able to read and, and glean the information that you want them to have as possible. So then you begin, begin writing. And again, you don't have to do this yourself. If you really are lousy at writing, you can have somebody come in and help write with you. Um, you can dictate and they can type if that's the way you need to do it. To do it. Um, so you begin your writing by starting with an introduction or you can start with your outline or, or title page or something of that nature but to begin the writing part you're going to start with an introduction of your project here's the thing i'm making um here's what i sort of want to get out of this project um and so that kind of steers the rest of your documentation really is if this is what i'm making here's where i'm going with this and then go so then you're going to start with your historical information all those who what when where why and how questions um, that you answered from before. That's going to be part of the main body of your of your documentation. But I like to say it's not actually the main part of your documentation. The main part of your documentation is going to be your project. But this section is how you're going to put your project into historical context. So this, it, to me, is, is a smaller section than your project itself. Does anybody want to chime in on that? Agree, disagree? Yeah. Okay. All right. So after you have now tell, told us who, what, when, where, why, and how of this historical thing that you are going to recreate, now you're going to tell us about the thing that you're recreating. So you want to show how you made the thing and explain any deviations from period that you have just talked about, explain deviations from, from the period practices. So deviations could be, um, I don't have a period bandsaw, but I have this modern bandsaw, and so I used the modern bandsaw. But in period, they would have used this. Um, I did not use silk thread because silk thread is heinously expensive. So I have used modern whatever it is thread, but in period, they would have used silk thread or whatever. You want to explain the thing that you have done and why it's different from period, if it's different from period, um, and just any sort of deviations that you have made. I see Kushag has something to say. I'm just thinking it's actually probably more the opposite. I've used silk for this and this, it, but silk thread would have been heinously expensive in period. They're, they would have used linen, <laughs> but I've right. used silk because I love silk. Right. So any anything that's a deviation from period. So basically what we're saying is that you can use modern materials for your thing if that's what you have access to, but you should be able to tell us what it is, what it would have been in period uh, etc. too. So as long as you can justify your reasons. Now, if you, on the flip side of that, if you are claiming that this is an absolutely histor historical reproduction of a blah, and you have used synthetic fiber instead of the linen or silk that it would have been, uh, 
then it's not a completely historical recreation then, is it? So you wanna be careful in how you word things as well. Right, so it's not that you can't use synthetic, it's that if you're claiming it's historical and it's not historical, then, you, then you'll get in trouble. Um, right, so as I said, you wanna show how you made the thing and any deviations from practice, uh, from period practice. And then make a conclusion or a summary of what the project was. So here's, here's what I did very quickly. Here's how it worked out or didn't work out if that's the case. Um, and maybe here's what I would have done differently had I, had I known this before I started. Okay, short, concise, just a summary of what's happened. And then after that, so in that whole section up there, you can put pictures and whatnot of your process um, in the historical section and whatnot. You can also have pictures in there, or you can have pictures side by side of your process and the historical, whatever. You can figure out how you want to format those sorts of things yourselves. But sometimes there's also other stuff that doesn't quite fit elsewhere, but I really need to put this in here. And this is particularly, I think, for Bardic stuff, at least in my experience. Um, that we end up with a lot of scores or different interpretations of scores or different interpretations of text, et cetera, et cetera, that we don't necessarily want to take up all of the body of our documentation with that stuff. So that's when you put that stuff in appendices. So you can put your photos and translations or scores or other extant anything or anything that you think is relevant but not necessary in the body of your document. Um, you can stuff those into your appendices. That's where I think pretty much everything else should go. Anybody else want to chime in on there? Yes, no? Okay. All right. And then you're going to put references. And I talk about references here as a whole section on its own. So we typically call your references your bibliography. Um, some people really don't like the term bibliography. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, but I don't know. Um, but your references in your bibliography are going to include books, articles, online websites, web books, ebooks, audio clips, CDs, DVDs, any conversations that you have had with other people, other experts, or et cetera. You should be able to put that into your bibliography as, as well. Um, you know, just to say, I had a conversation with uh, Mistress So and So on this date, and we talked about blah, and she said blah. You should be able to just put that in your in your bibliography because they are an expert, and whether it was written in a book is uh, irrelevant, really, if you're having that conversation. Um, and my, anything uh, that in my sorry, go ahead. Is we called that personal communications. Yeah, that, exactly. That a, a, a segment, a section of your own. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, and any anything that, from which you've gleaned any information, wherever it has come from, you should be able to put that into your bibliography. It's all relevant. Um, and so from that, you should also be doing citations. And citations can come in a different uh, in different forms. Ouch, sorry, I have cut my knuckle open and I'm not sure how, but it's bleeding. Anyway, um, citations. So if there's anything in your documentation that is not your original thought or information and conclusions, stuff that you have come up with independently, then it should be cited with your original source. If you do not do that, then you are claiming that information as your own. Um, and that's called plagiarism. So uh, if you are, for instance, quoting somebody out of a book um, and you don't quote them and actually give them the credit for that, uh, that quotation, then you are claiming that as being your own, infra your own um, thoughts. And that's plagiarism and you, don't, you really want to avoid doing that. Um, so you do make, need to make sure that it's cited. If you don't know how to do citations, please ask somebody to help you do your citations because it's really quite important. Um, and there are different forms. You can either, um, if you have you've read books and so on and so forth, you might see a little number at the end of a sentence or something. And then down at the bottom in smaller print, um, you'll see a citation that will usually have the name of the author and the book and what page it's on and all that sort of information. So you can either do that or you can do the little number at the end of the sentence and then put all of your citations on one big page at the end of your project. Either one is fine. There are also different styles of citation. Um, I personally don't have a particular 
favorite as far as citation styles go, but some judges do. Um, and it's kind of become a thing lately for you to uh, declare what style of writing you're using, uh, etc. cetera. Um, I personally don't care, but some judges do. So it, it, it's good to at least be consistent throughout your, your piece if you're gonna do one or the other. Um, does anybody have any sort of thoughts on that? I do. Um, there do. are a couple of, there's a number of um, websites that uh, help you do that for you. Yes. You put in as much information as you can and they translate it into something where you copy paste it. Um, some of them even take a look at your, at your little paper and do some stuff with it. And then there are little charts that describe what each of the different styles are mm -hmm. to give you an idea what might work best for you for what you are presenting. Yeah. And I have made very huge use of these things because I can't keep it in my head which one is which. Yeah, the one that uh, Kushag's holding up right now is a good one. Um, do you, if you have links to those, do you want to um, paste those into the chat room so people can take a look at them? <laughs> I, I know I what I will probably try. thinking of. Right. Yeah. Uh, Kiva also had something to say to you. Um, oh, I, I am unmuted. Um, I, my thing was kind of a little bit later on uh, in terms of the tips. I was just going to say, um, um, I, I, I have dyslexia and I know there's people out there with learning disabilities. And in, instead of letting that stop you, I just lean more heavily on people. And then I put an acknowledgement section. If mm -hmm. I've had somebody really help me with the editing, there's things that I do with my writing because I have that learning disability. Um, and that's why you have anyway, a section at the end. Um, so please, like you were saying before, don't be afraid to reach out, you know? So just, just I thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, as the person who's been running Kingdom A&S for a long time, I can tell you this, that the uh, documentation is the place where most people give up uh, when it comes to doing their entry uh, in, in um, to kingdom or even principality or even baronial. Um, part of that has to do with because they leave their documentation till the end um, and they don't start it right from the beginning. Um, and that's, I mean, there's certain portions of your documentation that you won't be able to do until the end. Like after you finished your project, you won't be able to talk about the end of your project and your conclusions until you've actually finished. So that makes sense. Uh, but starting your outline, starting taking your photographs, all of that kind of stuff, don't leave that till the end. Don't start um, trying to create your, your citation, well, not citations, but your references and so on um, at the end. You know, like you don't want to have to then go back and, oh, where was that quote I said, the saw that was really relevant and where did I find that again? Um, you want to make sure that you, you start documenting that kind of stuff before the end, because what's going to happen is you're going to get to the end of your project and that deadline is going to be looming. Um, and I can't tell you how many people have dropped out of the competition the day that documentation was done because or was due because they hadn't finished. Now, I will also say on top of that, if that's the only reason that you're dropping out of the competition because you haven't got your documentation done, I would rather as the person running the competition that you ask me for an extension to get your documentation finished than to drop out of the competition. And I will say this too, just because your documentation might not be fully finished, fleshed out, doesn't mean you don't have the information in your head and you can still impart that to your judges. Um, but your documentation is actually only worth about 15 to 20 percent of your overall score. So I'm not saying don't do documentation. I'm just saying don't let documentation stop you from entering thinking that it's going to drag you down because you haven't completed it or whatever. So that's a big tip for one. Um, ask for an extension if you really need it. More than likely, I will be the person to say, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. All right. Um, so some tips. Um, there's a couple of documents in the in the Google Drive, which uh, maybe I can get somebody in there to copy and paste that um, link that I put in the chat room again um, for anybody who joined later. I think it's right at the very top of the chat. From, anyway, um, there's a couple of documentations that other people have written on doing documentation. Uh, one is from Mistress Izzy, who did a class at uh, Collegium a few years ago on writing. And 
in there, she she had pulled um, the laurels, et cetera, and the and I think the just the, like the judging pool in general about what they're looking for when it comes to doc documentation. And um, so there's a lot of really good tips in there as well for what is makes good documentation. So I, I recommend reading through that. Um, there's also one in particular that was written by Mistress Alessandra uh, that is particularly about writing Bardic documentation. Um, so if that's your wonk, then you might want to take a look at that one too. Um, and there's another one in there, but I can't remember who that one's from. <laughs> Um, but there's also some examples of, of documentation when we'll, we'll look at some here quickly too. All right, so I did talk about this before, but here's some tips. So you wanna make sure your documentation is clear. So you want it clear what it is that your project is. If your project is not clear and you're sort of all over the place, uh, the judges are not gonna be able to follow you either. So you wanna make sure it's clear that it's concise. So not any longer than it has to be and that it's well organized and having a, an introduction um, and a title page will help you keep it organized. You wanna make sure that you're using the five W's and the H um, and coming up with all of those questions that you can possibly think of. And here's where we go, he says, I hate writing or I can't write, so what do I do? Documentation and research is a collaborative effort, or at least it can be a collaborative effort. If you're somebody who's super confident in doing your own writing and research, then please, by all means, do it. Um, but if you're not, it is okay for you to ask for help. You can have someone help you help you do it, but not do it all for you. So you have to be involved in your documentation. Um, you, yeah, I mean, you just can't. If you're having somebody else write your documentation for you and you had no input into it whatsoever, no, that doesn't work like that. But you can have somebody help you with the writing, the formatting, the research, even the typing of it, um, your citations. I didn't put proofreading on this list and I don't know why, but proofreading. Um, and then I actually suggest having more than one person proofread your document. Um, don't rely on yourself to proofread the thing, because I can tell you after I've been working on a paper for weeks and weeks, and I've stared at it oh, for hundreds of hours, I miss a lot of things. And then I will pass off to somebody else and they're all like, um, did you know you missed out an entire half a sentence here? Or but, uh, no, I didn't. So yeah, really important to have somebody else proofread your, your stuff. Um, and preferably two people, at least in my opinion. Um, and other people's mileage may vary on that one. So, okay, so that's it for this. So we're gonna look at some documentation here, if I can get this out of the way, there we go. Dee, dee, dee. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, so first off, I'm gonna look at this one here, oops. So this was one from um, Thora Yolosvari from Kingdom Bardic, or sorry, ANS a couple of years ago, in which she was doing a Burka brocaded tablet woven band circa 10th century Burka. Right on, all right. So here she has an introduction. This is what my project is. This is what I was looking at and what I set out to make. Then she has her social and historical concept, context of this particular thing, um, what it would look like, what it was for, et cetera, et cetera. And then she has a picture of here's the grave that it was found in um, and so on and so forth. And you'll notice that that really is about a page long. If you take that picture out, it's less than a page long. So not a huge um, section. Then she talks about the methods and materials that were used to make the original. Um, then she has a bit of a you know, controversy over the methods and materials um, that may not be relevant to your project, but for this one, it was. Um, and then she provides an extant example. And then she talks about her making of her reproduction. And she includes lots of pictures of how she made this thing. Um, and in particular, she actually made two. This was her first verse draft, as it were. More pictures. She has a kind of a step-by-step -step how I did this. And she keeps going. 
And then in here, she's talking about how, how I made this, how it worked out, how it didn't work out, how my sort of um, theory on how this was going to be turned out to not quite work. So I had to change things a little bit. Um, then she talks about all of the sort of components that went into making this thing, including she made a warp weighted loom for it. And then here's the actual project that she entered after she'd sort of gone through this process of making this thing, first of all, okay, done this, now I'm gonna go on to making an, the actual thing with using the information that I've now gleaned from having done it once already. And yeah, and then she talks about what the materials, et cetera, that were different from how they were supposed to be in period and some comparison pictures. And then she has her uh, conclusion here with her final thoughts on how the project went. And then she has a bibliography. So she didn't include any uh, appendices, but you don't have to. Um, but yeah, so this was 16 pages, including all of those pictures and her bibliography. Really, when you if you took all those pictures out, it's not a lot of typing. Um, and just as an aside here, here's what I was talking about when I talked about citations. Um, so you'll notice right here, there's a little 13 at the end of a sentence. And if you go down here, there's a 13. And so then she's got a little bit more information on this thing here. Um, later on in her bibliography, you'll see that she's probably um, referenced the books, et cetera, et cetera, that that's come out of. So that's one kind of documentation. Let's go back. Um, I think it's this one. So this one's 10 pages. This was from Seamus, who was doing a bunch of entries on um, medicinal things, particularly pertaining to Henry VIII. Um, and so same thing, he has a bit of an introduction uh, talking about Henry, VIII, Henry VIII here and a bit of the historical, what medical issues he had, and there were many. Um, he's got his citations in there. Um, some bits from the original text. Oops. Um, and uh, I think this was a recipe for whatever treatment they were using for this particular ailment. Um, and then the sort of processes they went through to, to treat that ailment. And then I believe he goes on for, uh, yeah. So I think in there, there's also how he made his thing etc. And then he goes into his bibliography. So this was 10 pages with all the pictures and quite a lot of extant um, things. Again, not a lot of writing, but a lot of pictures. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and note too that there's cover pages and all that. There's one page right there. That's yeah. There. So some of them do have a cover page on them, like this one. That would be Tanique's from her Nubian uh, bishop's cloak. So here she goes, again, context of the artifact. She gives a picture of the, the patterning, talks about her project and I think repatterning, um, and then her conclusion and expansion, some appendices at the end with other pictures and supporting documentation. There's a picture of the extant thingy and then her references at the end eight pages, but everything she needed was in there. So again, not a huge amount of writing, um, but lots of pictures that explain the thing. And it's like I said, if you can, if you can give all of those relevant information, all those WWWH um, in two pages, then that's great. As long as you've covered those, that's great. So it's not super huge. Um, I'm going to go back up to the top here a second. Whoops. That's not where I wanted to go. Let's go into here. Mm -mm. Sorry. Uh, is it in there? No. Where did I put it? Uh oh. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, I'm going to look at a Bardic, some Bardic stuff as well. Okay. So. This is my own documentation. I am in no way claiming that my documentation is perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. I just want that disclaimer out there, first of all. 
All right, so this was one that I had started doing for Kingdom Bardic a few years ago, uh, and then they changed the, the entire format of how Bardic is done, so this is now irrelevant for Bardic, but this is how I did it. Again, I'm not claiming this is perfect, but here we go. So this is my title page uh, and my table of contents. Um, so then I talk about the context of the ballad, uh, a little bit of history of it, the context of the ballad itself, because for this particular ballad, uh, the context, the historical context and the, the context of what's going on in Norway and Sweden and Denmark at that time is very, very relevant for this particular ballad. So that is important. Um, and then I analyzed the music and the text um, for the performance of this piece, gave a little bit of historical doc uh, uh, background um, I, in hindsight, I probably should have moved that further up, but I didn't. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. And then I get into appendices. I didn't actually really talk a lot in here about how I was going to be performing this thing, and I probably should have, but I didn't. But then I have the appendices. So there's the, um, the translation of the piece, um, and it's a very long piece. I did not do the whole thing, just so you know. <laughs> I think I did 10 out of the 24 verses. Um, here is a text, or I mean, a picture of the tune. Um, here was a printing from 1572 of the actual text. Um, and then this one here is um, from 1583, but this is the original text of the thing. So this is what I actually wrote to that uh, library slash museum and ask them for pictures of this particular book because I knew where it was. So they went and took these pictures for me. And so that's actually it. Um, and then I just have further translations, et cetera, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then because of this being a music thing, I also talked about the structure of balladry since this was a ballad um, and a bit of the classifications. And I talk a little bit about a liar because I was accompanying myself on a liar. So that's more of my process stuff right there than anything else. And then the ridiculous bibliography. Okay. Now I'm gonna show you something that is much shorter, assuming that I put it in here. Oh yeah. I think this is the one, yeah. So this was from Owen the Merry, Master Owen the Merry, um, who won Kingdom Bardic uh, in 2015, I think it was. Um, although this is 2013, I'm pretty sure this was from 2015 though. So there's a title page, great. Talks about an introduction here, it's very short. Talks a little bit about the actual piece, also very short, a little bit about the author. And then the vast majority of this thing is about his performance. So his processes of making making this piece. Um, so again, whether it's bardic or, or an object or whatever. Um, and then his bibliography and a picture and then the extant, whatever it is. That's it, six whole pages for the entire thing. And the most of that is pictures. Very short. So again, as long as you've got the relevant information, all of those five W's and the H, it doesn't have to be 50 pages long and still be very good documentation. All right. Now I've got other examples in there too. We're not gonna go through all of them because there's quite a few, um, but feel free to like go and take a look at these. Um, so there's some ANS examples in here of just ones that I thought were we're good documentation. Um, this one from Taryn, it looks like it's all the same document. It's not. She actually has three different projects, um, but she used a lot of the same pictures from each of those projects because she was making an entire outfit from the inside out. Um, so anyway, but she does, she did very good um, documentation for it. So again, some of these are very long, some of them are very short. Um, and yeah, so just examples of different kinds of writing that you can do. Um, there was one I was going to show you too. Oh, here. Oops, sorry. Wrong. Where did I go now? Uh-oh. Mm, must be in there. So 
I'm only going to talk about this really quickly because it's and, and it's only going to be relevant to anybody who is interested in doing Bardic at this point in time. Um, so in the Bardic competition uh, for Kingdom at this time, you are only allowed 500 words for your documentation. That's it, 500 words. This is 498. This is from, from me. So we just talked about this piece of um, Falkmore Lomanson was the one I previously showed you of my documentation. I took that documentation, squashed it down to 498 words, which I'm gonna say was not easy. <laughs> Uh, but all of the relevant information that I needed to be in there is there. Plus I put in the text translation, the picture of the actual tune, the actual piece, because you're allowed to, they didn't say we couldn't do appendices, <laughs> loophole. Um, so yeah, so then I just stuck them all into appendices and bibliography, but the actual text is 498 words. <laughs> That's it. So it can be done and it can be done in point form. I don't even care if your, your documentation is point form or if it's written like an essay, or if it's written like a high school essay, that's great. Point form is also good, as long as you have that relevant information. All right, so if somebody posted up that link in the chat room, that will bring you to this document or this folder and you can have a look at what's in there, um, some examples and so on and so forth. There's also, I po posted up the rubrics for the Kingdom ANS Championships object form. I only put the object form, I didn't put for all of them. The process form is a little bit different, um, but just so you can take a look at it and see what, you know, sort of on here in case you've never looked at it before, um, but you can have a peek at it. All of the forms for Kingdom are on the Kingdom ANS website. Um, I'm assuming the ones for Tier E are also on the Tier E website. Um, and I don't know about Lionsgate or, uh, and I don't think Lionsdale has any, but, um, or yeah, anyway, so you can have a peek in there. Um, as long as you have that link there, you should be able to get into this file. And uh, if you have a problem, please let me know. I'm going to stop screen sharing here now. Whoops. There we go. Okay. So uh, if y'all want to turn on your mics uh, and whatnot, and if you have questions um, to ask, please do. I'm going to pop my email into the chat, though. Oops. So yeah. I have a, a, a couple things. Uh -huh. uh, one uh, about reading through the judging forms. Yes. As somebody who's done a fair amount of judging, I think that is one of the most important things you can do. I've coached several people through Kingdom and Principality Arts and Sciences, and I'm a firm believer in the concept of leave no points on the table. Yeah. yeah so absolutely. read the forms, figure out where you can gain points anywhere. And it's a bit like gaming the system, but I think it works really, it really. It absolutely is gaming the system and there's nothing wrong with that. No. <laughs> I mean, I mean, to me, it's a no brainer. It should be the first thing that you do is go look at the judging forms and figure out what I need to do to get this score. Um, I... Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, the uh, last part was about uh, too much documentation, which uh, as a judge, I've seen so many times. And honestly, I've read through documentation that was 75 pages and took about 30 of it to get to the point and got lost somewhere in the middle and they ended up getting a fairly poor score because I didn't know what I was supposed to be judging in the first place because they weren't yeah. very clear. Yeah and that's that's well there you just hit the nail head there it wasn't clear so that's why I say it needs to be clear what your subject is and that you need to make sure that everything that you're putting into your documentation is relevant and necessary for your documentation to support the whatever it is that you're making. Anything else outside of that just makes things <clears throat> muddy. Um, and yeah, you're right there. I have seen other people who have gotten low scores on their documentation because it was too long and it was too padded with stuff that wasn't relevant or necessary. And well, I mean also, that myself. So I, I mean, yeah. I'm putting up my hand. I am guilty of it myself. Yeah. Also because of the documentation was uh, set up the way it was, it became difficult for the rest of the entire sort of judging process to understand what exactly we were supposed to be judging. We ended up in judging the entire object instead of the thing on the object that we're supposed to be judging because she was very unclear what the entry actually was. Right, yeah. So. I know when I was doing my honors thesis, they actually put a maximum word count on it and said that you'll that basically you'll be penalized if you go beyond the word count. Right. 
and you know sometimes that's a, that's actually a good tool um i mean certainly when i had to take my documentation for folk for and, and take it down from i think it was 17 pages down to 498 words um i had to chop out a whole lot of stuff that i was like okay well i guess that's not really relevant and this is not really relevant and it was really quite amazing actually how much was irrelevant that i thought was relevant right um it, it's not so much irrelevant as embellishment embellishment yes yeah you know it is you're you're bearing it bearing it out to the bare bones whereas actually in a, in a proper world you'd want a little bit more information but that's where the judges can go back to you right. and ask for it yeah kiva seems to be wanting to um, say something i was thinking about you had you had a good list of myths that are still alive and well and there was two more i was thinking of that for your okay. list and one of them is you have to do documentation to become a laurel that and is I, true and i would say that that's not necessary Doc, i love documentation I, I it's my jam but it's not everybody's jam yeah. um and so if you like researching think about other ways you can get your knowledge out there maybe that's through a website or a blog or a facebook artisan page um mm -hmm. a lot of people are doing artisan pages now so there's other routes you can go if this is not your jam do not feel like if you're in your heart want to be a laurel um there's other routes to get there having said that i am obviously pro broke on documentation so that was one <laughs> i was thinking of. and the other one i was other myth i was thinking of is that the judges are there to trick you and i think people can sometimes be and i i've entered kingdom ans twice i've won once there's a lot on the line and, and, and a lot of, of pressure and stress goes into entering that weekend. Um, but you're, the, the questions that judges are asking, um, they're trying to get information out of you. And maybe they've seen, they've read the documentation and they think, oh, like there's this one question I have that this didn't get addressed and I'm gonna ask you it. Mm -hmm. Like assume people are asking things in good faith because they're just trying to pull information out of you that maybe you didn't even think about including, but is still in your brain um and you'll see it like they'll get a big smile on their face like yes that's yeah. exactly what i was looking for and they're all like happy yeah like, anyway. i'm gonna i'm gonna jump in before guido and um Sav do for one second the the one comment i get most from the people who enter kingdom um ans or bardic for that matter uh afterwards is the judges didn't read my documentation because uh, they kept asking me these questions they didn't obviously didn't read my documentation and so Sometimes that might actually be true. I will just put that out there. But a lot of times, as Kiva said, they're trying to glean more information out of you. And it isn't that they haven't read your documentation. They just want to actually know that you really actually know this and what else you know that you haven't put in the documentation. And um, what so, important piece of information did you not put in your documentation that it needs to come out in order for it to make sense? Right. Yeah. So, so just so it's clear, documentation isn't just what you've written on the paper documentation is also what's in your head too and that that's the judge, judge's job is to find out what information you actually have that might not actually be on the paper and guido had something to say here too um so when it comes to uh actually judging uh, and i've done a lot over the years the one thing i i tend to do a lot uh tend to do almost to excess is hammer people on their method and their process so i i'm really a uh, I find that by doing that, you get more information out of people. So sometimes that people think I'm being kind of rude because I keep going over the same same topic over and over again, but I really need a piece of information. I'm quite often looking for something very specific that is mentioned in the documentation. And it's my, my question is basically, did they actually know this or did they just find it in a book and write it down? Right. So that's kind of all I had to say on that. <laughs> yep. So if you had something to say? Yeah. Um... Going back to the forms, the judging forms, mm -hmm. um, I'm a very, when it comes to presenting, very anxious, nervous person. Um, I don't speak well on the fly. Uh, and so reading that, reading those forms and having someone walk me through what they were meaning helped a lot. And I've only entered once where I, uh, it was the Thierry Arts and Sciences. It was a process. It was just, the idea was to give me the experience of entering, not actually mm -hmm. try and win or, because I only did one entry. And what I found was that the judges actually gave me so many rabbit holes 
I was taking notes <laughs> yeah. and it was such a positive experience. I mean, like I said, presenting um, and talking where I might be caught flat footed on something to me fills me with all kinds of anxiety. But having that form, reading it through, and then the judges were just really encouraging. And I just found there, I ended up, it's, it really felt like it was a conversation of geeking out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what else I could go looking for. So yeah. it was a really pause, like I said, so someone with, with that kind of anxiety, I walked away encouraged, empowered, excited, and looking forward to the next time I get a chance to. Mm -hmm. I saw Kiva's hand come up. Yeah, I was thinking about something else because this talk is often directed more at people in the barony. If you if you if you've entered at a baronial level, um, and it was it was a really positive experience, and you've entered at tier level, and that was a really positive experience, and you're thinking about kingdom, don't do what I did, which is I had never been to kingdom, and I decided to do a full entry without knowing <laughs> anything about the culture shift yeah. from tier to on tier. Think about doing a single entry like tip, dip mm -hmm. your toe in the water. Um, I, I really wish, because I, I entered feeling really cocky and got squished um, and, and, and looking back, I was like, you know what? I think I got squished because I wasn't prepared, um, but it took me like a year to kind of get work through it. Um, so I would definitely recommend, or just go and experience. Don't mm -hmm. do a full, try and tackle a full entry on your first go, like go there, be a student judge. There's lots of ways to be involved where you can see, oh, okay. If you're a student judge, you can also sit with the judges and see how they go through this them. Okay. And then it's going to preload you for the, you know, the onslaught of the next year when you, when you yeah. do full and, and win. So that's what I would recommend is like be strategic. Think about just going and really absorbing, like be a sponge for, for everything that's happening. You mean the next two years, the year that you're yeah. doing, making it. And then the year following when you're yeah. Shooting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a really important thing too. And that that is like, if you're planning to enter, don't like wait until the deadline of when entries are supposed to be in, which traditionally has been the Sunday night or Monday, whatever it is of 12th night. Uh, you should have already been started that project probably a year ahead of that. Um, if you're waiting till then to actually start, that gives you only two and a half months ish to do your entire project from research to documentation to making the thing. So yeah, you want to be planning to enter two years at least in advance um, of your thing. Additionally, I, I, one of the greatest pieces of advice I can give anybody who's thinking about entering, whether it's Tiri or Kingdom or, or whatever, um, is to, as Kiva said, try student judging because you will get such an incredibly different insight into um, how the judging process works and how doing your, pro even just to um, apply that to how you do your presentation, how you make your documentation, how, you know, all of those uh, relevant components. Um, student judging is a valuable, valuable thing for anybody. Uh, it also gets you more familiar with how the judging forms themselves work. Um, and in addition to, as you said, I would suggest doing a single entry uh, as opposed to jumping in with both feet. I am also one of those who jumped in with both feet. Um, and yeah, at that time in particular, the difference between Kingdom Bardic and Tyrese Bardic was like a vast gulf of difference. They didn't even resemble one another, but mm -hmm. I did not know that. Yeah. Um, so, and people so, told, yeah. Me, told me, but I ignored them because I, I knew what I was doing. Then, yeah, yeah, nobody then I was. Nobody. I mean, I, I just sort of expected there would be sort of a step up from Kingdom for, mm -hmm. to, from Tyrese to Kingdom, but like this wasn't a step up. This wasn't even close. <laughs> <laughs> so It was a cliff. It was a cliff. Yeah, no, really was. I mean, I still had a really good positive experience. Yes, I mean, obviously. But both I, times I, I, I have been, I've gone to Kingdom ANS and just, oh, you're entering. There is so much love that is directed towards you and so much support. Mm -hmm. um, it's just amazing. It is an amazing yeah. love fest of people that love to geek out about yeah. the, the craziest things. It's a very things. Um, different environment than from when I first started entering things at Kingdom level. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you how many years ago. <laughs> yeah so, you know like, let's just say i've got a picture of you with my eldest daughter as a baby uh -huh. <laughs> i remember when she was born <laughs> yeah I you know it, it, you're right it, 
sorry, go ahead, Cleto. I, I just want to say something. Uh, so I've been a Laurel for 20 years now. This is my 20th year. Um, and I've been judging arts and sciences contests for at least 15 of those years. And I have never in my entire career entered an arts and sciences contest at all, Likewise. at any level. Oh. Um, so for those who think you have to enter to be looking to, to get to that Laurel level, no, you don't. No. It's a great way of getting your information about what you do out there and sort of broadening your, your visibility. But there's a lot of other methods. For some people, entering arts and sciences contests just aren't the thing they want to do. They're just not into that s sort of scrutinization of what, what, they, what of their art. Yep. And if, that, if you're not into that, that's fine. But you do have to get what you do out for the broader audience to see. So look at like, doing a, um, an artist page or uh, show people at events or find other methods. You don't have to enter a contest. I yeah. maybe when we get back to going again, I've actually got a plan of entering arts and sciences now that I do things that you can actually see and hold and look at to actually judge as opposed to something ephemeral like combat, which is hard to judge. So I may actually right. enter one soon, but I haven't yet. Yeah. Interestingly, um, yeah. Um, Sorry, I was just going to say on that on that vein, there is actually an event that, um, called Athenaeum. Mm -hmm. um, for anybody who has not heard of Athenaeum, Athenaeum is strictly a display event. Um, and the way it works is that you uh, enter this thing. It's not a competition of any kind. You're not competing against yourself or anybody else. You're simply there to display the thing or things that you are doing. Um, and so this is particularly a good thing for people who are not comfortable with competition um, or who don't want to go that direction. That, that's totally fine. As Kiva said, you don't have to. Um, Athenaeum is, is designed specifically for people like that. Um, and so, yeah, you go there, you display your thing. Uh, this year it was all online because obviously COVID. Um, but you display your stuff and then uh, Laurels or other people will sign up to come and talk to you. Um, and I think they're usually, it's 15 minutes or half an hour. Um, they just get to sit down and talk to you about your project. Um, and it might just be a complete geek fest. Hey, I do this same thing. And isn't that neat when we blah? And it might also, it might be a two-way conversation of, have you thought about blah, 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 or et cetera, et cetera. So it's definitely a much more low key um, sort of thing for people who are not interested in competition because not everybody is. Some people just plain don't like competing or it makes them too nervous or whatever. Or, or some people, people like cannot me. put in the time to serve or, as champion. It, well, there's that too because that is a big consideration. Um, or you get people like me who I thrive on competition but not because I actually like to compete against other people. For me, it's more about a, a having an end goal, a deadline um, to actually get a project thing done <laughs> because otherwise it's sort of I'll get it done someday. Um, yeah, so uh, on that vein, though, I was going to say, too, when you're entering competition, you're not actually really entering against someone else. You're not competing against anybody else except yourself when you go in there. So if you go into the competition with the attitude of, for one, I'm, I'm not here to compete. I'm here to teach. So I'm here to teach the judges or the, the audience or whoever else who happens to come past the table about this thing that I have done that I really love, et cetera, et cetera. Um, even if that person knows more about that thing than you do, you still can teach them. And so if you go in there and instead of saying, I'm going into my judging session, I'm going in to teach these people in front of me about this thing that somehow psychologically takes you out of competition a little bit, right? Then it's a little less nerve wracking. I'm not, I'm not competing against the guy at the next table, et cetera, et cetera. It's I'm here to learn or to teach you about this thing. And in the process, I might actually learn some things as well. And that's great. Um, yeah, so it doesn't have to be a competition so much. Um, yeah, I mean, the end, end goal, or I should say the end goal, the end product could be that you might win and you might get a shiny cloak and a thing for the, that you get to do for the whole year. Um, but if your whole goal of going into the competition is that cloak at the end and then you don't get it, was the whole process completely worthless then? And if the answer to that is yes, then maybe you shouldn't be entering the competition if that's your goal. Um, it just, I, I, I just feel that. I do feel people need to keep in mind that um, going into Kingdom ANS or or a Bardic competition and not being willing or able 
to serve is the same as, or, as entering crown lists. Right. Without it, it no is. intention to rule. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and on top of that, as I said, there is always the possibility that you may not win. I mean, I entered Kingdom Bardic three times before I finally won the fourth time. So um, if it had only been about winning that cloak, I would have stopped the first time that I entered because I didn't win, right? Um, yeah, so that can't be your, your sole purpose. Now I saw, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to butch your name, Lady Gwyn Gwynefell? Yeah, I just okay. wanted to say, say uh, thank you to everybody that, that put this together and to Gala for, for you know, head spearheading it. I have to go, but I wanted to say thank you to everybody. Right. And um, this was awesome. It helped cool. me out a lot. Awesome. Yeah. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me as well. Um, but honestly, if you have questions, you can ask anybody in, in like the laurels or people who have entered before and we'll be happy to talk your ear off. So yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Is there any other questions or anything? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, like, sort of build on what you said is that I actually hate entering competitions. I don't like the pressure. I don't like the but what I do like is talking about stuff I've done and things I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. And entering a competition gives me a framework to actually get the thing done. Yeah, yeah, and, no, I agree. And it also gives me, as a judge, um, a view of the other side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I, like I've entered Kingdom a couple of times with single projects. Um, and I think that that's probably... The own as far as I will ever go at kingdom level, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. just because you, I, like, I don't like that. Because you have, <laughs> because you have done that though. Could you talk a little bit maybe about your like the the process um, and and because I like I know for instance your last project that you did, which was the the cloak. Mm -hmm. um, I know they had a problem with judging that piece, but it wasn't because of your piece. It was because of the judging forms. Yes. And yeah. actually, interestingly, um, I feel like I generated a whole new um, judging did. form because you of did. that. <laughs> you did. Yeah. Um, we now, we now have was, one for uh, experimental archaeology because yes, of that um, project. Because so. of that. Yeah. And, and that was the thing is that I looked at the judging forms and I said, Jesus, this doesn't fit this one. It doesn't really fit this one. It's kind of this one, but not. So I took two judging forms and I looked at them and I, I sort of just, I did eeny, meeny, miny, mo, literally. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it didn't quite fit either one of them. And again, I was expecting, well, this probably isn't going to get great points. But I want to do this to see how it works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because it was basically kind of what we do really which is I found an artifact that fascinated me um, and I had to right away to a museum and it, and it took me two years to trace down you know where it was <laughs> mm -hmm. and then between starting it and actually getting a hold of information contact information for the women who, woman who wrote the article she had died oh <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> yeah so, um, and so basically I just recreated the piece from the information I could and a few other bits of information like the kind of stitches and stuff and, and thread that was used in various other similar artifacts in various places. And it didn't do well. And, but I was kind of devastated, but I was kind of like, well, no, I, I went into it knowing that that might happen. Um, mm -hmm. And then actually I have to say, um, Eleanor de Poulton was really amazing. She came to me afterwards and talked to me about it. And says, I know you didn't really do really well, but you know what? Your thing was awesome. It's, it's, yeah. it's the form, not you. And she really, really emphasized that. And actually she and I started geeking out on gardening because we're both into like historical plants. <laughs> right, yeah, no, so, it's funny because- I mean, they, I, I met some amazing people just doing the project. Yeah. Yeah, your judges actually came to me afterwards and said that very same thing. They're like, the project is great. The yeah. forms do not work for this project. Yeah. Um, and so it was because born out of that was the ar experimental archaeology um, uh, forms, which we actually haven't had a chance to use yet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So so sometimes that's a really good process, you know, you know, you, yeah. Anyway, yeah. so but you I know you learned from that and you met a whole bunch of different people and yeah. um, they were well, they were quite excited. So, yeah. 
Yeah, and I reconnected with people I hadn't seen in ages at that particular event, not partic necessarily. And then the people that were in the room with me presenting, we started geeking out about yeah. each other's stuff. <laughs> so, That's some of my favorite parts of Booking. I know, actually. I know, right? <laughs> Which is why Athenaeum is kind of my perfect thing. It still yeah. gives me a goal. I have to finish whatever I'm doing. I have to be organized. Mm -hmm. But there isn't that sort of judginess. I don't, right. you know, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm and that's 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 specifically why that event was made was because there's not that judginess, judginess, right? I actually I, hate the term judges. I really do. I, I hate it. Yeah. I wish we could find a different term to use. I was like I wanna, adjudicator. I, wanna, I don't know. Adjudicator would probably be the, the closest thing. Yeah, mm. that's the only thing I come up with too, because the rest of it just sounds judgy. judgy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like it, it just has that negative connotation, right? Like at, like, at the end of it, it is a competition. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, like that's, and I, you know, I don't like the ones that I have won, I didn't expect to win. Like mm -hmm. I looked at Alexander's armoring stuff and I went, oh man, he is so out there. He's going to win. And then that's the year that I became the principality champion. Right. Um, and it was like, wow, like I'm compared to that. Wizards. <laughs> um, Wizards. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah and i mean i've won a number of other competitions um some that i looked around and went oh my god i am overqualified for this mm. level of competition and won um and other ones where i went really okay <laughs> um yeah. so you I, know, I, just I, looking at other people's stuff so it's 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 checking the forms and really looking at what they're looking for mm -hmm. um, and and whether you meet the criteria well and that's just it you, i mean it was harder with the old forms but these forms are very specific in mm -hmm. um in their rubrics and that's like if you want to get a five on this form this is what you need to do mm -hmm. um or if you want to get a six which is now the bonus point section this is what you need to do mm -hmm. but you can then also look at it and go okay well my documentation doesn't really cover this so it's fair that i probably got a one or two on here so you can self-check yourself against these yeah. two things too yeah. right um and then it's not quite such a big surprise um there is also too i should mention as well when it comes to the documentation there is another or sorry not documentation the judging forms there is another form that goes along with the judging forms and i I'm, i'll maybe pop it into that um google drive uh folder as well uh, and basically it explains the rubrics and it explains what each number of those rubrics rubrics mm -hmm. means um, sort of in more more terms of like a one is is uh, what we would expect to see in a blah and a six is we would expect to see this thing in in a museum or written up in a you know academic paper that kind of stuff so you can really see from that um where you sit but also it puts it into context of um how, if you were using this kingdom form for say your baronial competition like um, here's what down to yeah right so here's where we would expect a baronial competition to sit within this form so it might be you know one to two or to three or whatever and then at a principality level we might expect to see in sort of this area and at kingdom we were kind of expecting to see up here or may maybe expect is a is a wrong word but um um yeah it kind of kind of helps you uh, look at it because a lot of people have come out of like uh, well, let's say using the kingdom form at baronial level and they only scored one or two but they expected they should have gotten a four or five um and then we've tried to explain re retroactively about um well actually that's not a bad score for a baronial level but what do you mean that that's only a 30 or 40 percent well actually but that's good for a baronial level and yeah so yeah that kind of is difficult so this other form which i will pop in there because i can't remember the name of it right in this moment um kind of explains how that works and so it's not quite such a hard blow when it comes to um the competition itself mm -hmm. and while we're chatting about that i'm just going to do that now because i'll forget otherwise i just want to i just want to take a second here and gala this is a surprisingly tricky topic to talk about it's, it's it easy is. to talk about it on a superficial level but to drill in in a way that's informative without being intimidating, that's engaging while still being relevant, 
while passing on these bits of pieces that you've built up over your, you know, your career dedication in on, onto your ANS. It's awesome. I think you did an amazing job. Oh, thank you. I don't think there's ever been a talk where I like spent the entire time nodding. I was like, yep, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. I was yeah, like, yeah. I just thought I like for a while I was like, I totally agree with this. And then I just gave up because I was like, yeah, like, I totally <laughs> I actually, agree with everything you're saying. I actually um, that's okay. awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you did a you did just a fabulous job. I'm so Perfect. glad. And I'm so glad now I also know you're here as a baronial um resource for anybody who is you like I'm, I'm thinking about doing this and I don't know what I don't know how to start you're here and I'm just it makes me feel so glad to know that that you're here and um, yeah absolutely that you're engaged yeah in if you have questions of any kind so um, I, I can't necessarily guarantee that I will have the answers but I will at the very <laughs> least try and find somebody who does have answers for you or that can help that actually ever. brings up another thing too is that uh, for somebody who is starting off to do a project it does not hurt them to find somebody in their local area who has some experience perhaps in that. Um, and this is where, you know, talking to, if, if they're not sure who, talking to the local arts mistress or mm -hmm. arts and sciences, talking to the local bardic champions, you know, or, or, or various sundry other people, finding out who, who is doing that. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. back in the, in, the, uh, in the dark ages when I was mistress of arts, I tried to keep track of who was doing what, mm. just sort of overall who it, or who had been doing what. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with Curtis being master of sciences, often it was the same phone call, mm -hmm. you know, getting information from each household sort of thing for yeah. our once a year report, uh, yeah. big report. And then I did sort of little kept up with, you know, what, who's doing what, who's doing what. Yeah. Events. yeah. Uh, but having an idea, of, you know, who has done stuff in cooking. Oh, right. well, there's Monique and there's Elvina and there's um you know quite a few other people now i i know of yeah uh, but you know th th that would definitely be my first two names on the list yeah, <laughs> yeah you, well uh, and it's not just the laurels either like there are plenty of people in in lionsgate in Thierry, uh who hello? have who have knowledge or who have entered like tenny being a prime example she's not a laurel but she has entered kingdom so she has some insights on how this works um, and she would be a good person to talk to as well. So um, there's I mean, lots I'm, of people. I, 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 I judge at Kingdom all the time. ANS before I was a Laurel. Right. Because there weren't that many music types and they needed a music judge. Yep. 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 We still always need lots of music judges to be fair. But <laughs> yeah. Well, we, can, we can always use music entrance too, from what I gather. Well, that too. Yes. I know the, the year that Brynja won, she had sort of put herself in as a second thing or a last person so the contest, contest could run. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of it, there, there's luck of the draw there too, is it all depends on who's entered. Well, that's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. I mean, that is true. if you have, yeah. a, you no. have a, a good entry and everybody else is sort of a little lower, you're going to shine. You could well, have you know what? Entry and everybody else has a stellar entry. That is a little tougher. She, she, and I entered the same year. It was, uh, it was her, myself, and Ke um, Kevin. Um, yeah, I, I think, think we were the only three, hands down. Yeah, I think we were the only three. And she said to me, like, "Oh well, you're entered, so I, you know, I'm not going to win." And then she went and won. So I was like, "Just because I'm entered and I'm a Laurel does not mean I'm going to win." So, um, so yeah. Gala. Um, mm -hmm. I can't I can't sing a note and I can't play a musical instrument, but I can read music and okay. and read research. So if you need a music judge, good to know. Excellent, excellent. That yeah, and one of the, sure. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I uh, and, and that's this is not to say that it hasn't been done in the past, but um, one of the things that we've been doing um, in the sort of Kingdom ANS office um, is actually creating an online database of laurels and judges um because not all judges are laurels uh but the database of here's what is my sort of area of expertise and here's the areas i'm also good at doing and here's areas i'm not good at doing don't ask me to judge those things um so that we're keeping that data da database too so again like if you have a have a question that i can't answer i have a whole long list of people that i can find um that can help answer questions yeah. so 
and you get to keep people who is who have specific areas of interest and expertise and others who are like the most incredible generalists yes they don't necessarily have a specific area but man they're good across the board yeah um, and he, linda is one of them so uh, is one of those Malin, uh, alicia and male the willful one of them is a good one well, roberto yeah. roland was one of those yeah and you know it, the, what helps now too is that the new kingdom um judging forms and which Thierry is also using the same forms too because the forms used to be very arbitrary like just as an example there was 10 bonus points you could give on those forms and those bonus points could be for anything i actually got a form that said i got bonus points because they liked my socks yeah never leave points on the table right so <laughs> So now uh, there's no such thing as bonus points anymore. It's like if you got bonus points on this, it's because that was like a museum quality thing. Um, but also because we're using the rubrics, which is very specific, it takes some of that subjectivity from judges out of it a little oh, bit. Yeah. Um, I found sorry. the ones I was using at Kingdom NS were yeah. um, extremely yeah. limiting. And again, more for artifacts than for performance right and quite frankly it was uh, using the bonus points was our way of finding anything to give to <laughs> one of the candidates yeah you know that was our that was our yeah sometimes that's true sometimes that's true kiva had your you had, you had your i hand. did I, one source of points that people leave on the table and underestimate is the display <laughs> And I would definitely recommend taking a couple minutes to review um, retail display in, uh, advice online. Because when I first entered, I, I was working in a retail store. And so I learned the things like, okay, you display things at different heights. So I had like um, shoe boxes that I put at different heights and then I covered with a cloth and it was, and I got, so display is, I think, one of the one of those ones. It's not maybe related to documentation so much, but uh, it's definitely well, but the, add, adds those points up. It does, yeah. I mean, we're talking about competition here for the most part, right? So that's that is relevant. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. That is something that people sort of last minute think about. Oh, how am I going to display this thing? And sometimes you may have things that aren't necessarily or aren't necessarily displayable things. Like, for instance, if you're doing a research paper. Or you just gonna throw a bunch of papers down on the table and call it done? Um, that's not terribly interesting. <laughs> now, so you may want to consider having some sort of visual, something that adds to blah blah blah. Bardic is the same. We don't necessarily have a thing to display because we're there to play music or say a, say a poem or whatever. Uh, but we can think about backdrop or ambiance or something of that nature, right? The so. thing I would say too is if is if you were if you're your display build it up at home take pictures of every level and then when you're unpacking it at your table make sure you know the dimensions of the table that you're displaying your thing at <laughs> and then set it up exactly um as you did at home and because if you do set it up at home you'll realize you have forgotten some things oh i need a bowl to show this thing i need right it's just, it's also just show those pictures also show those pictures to somebody else because there may you may have uh overdone it or miss something or so get as much input from people mm -hmm. as you possibly can especially people who have judged or have entered yeah yes. or if you displayed it in this way you've changed the focus from your actual thing to this yeah slideshow um, i also that i that i learned about my one display was the idea of sometimes you can put too much on the table mm -hmm. and it becomes such a confusion that they don't know what they're looking at they don't know where things go or what's like, especially if you've got something that grouped, because my display was I actually had three different fibers that I had spun. And so if I just threw them all onto the table, who knows what's there? But if by putting it, what's it, and putting and bringing forward what's most important, mm -hmm. then understanding that someone coming along um, either before or after the judges, they're going to want to take a look at this. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're not there to explain it. Well, and two, I would also help point out the table is not your only display place. 
So you can display on the table, you can display under the table, you can display beside the table, you can, in some places you're allowed to just put things on the wall. So if you're not just limited to your table too, but also if it's not stated anywhere how big your table is, ask. Hmm. Because if you plan on a display for an eight foot table and you get there and you only have a six foot table, well, that might not seem like much. It's huge. But it's huge, right? <laughs> or you find out that, oh, your table is round and not rectangular. Well, then that changes things, right? So you want to, if, if, if I or whoever my successor is doesn't say your tables are this, um, then ask. Yeah. Did craft fairs with my late mother for many years. And, you know, if you went in and they said, oh, yes, you've got an eight foot table and you go in and you find there's six foot tables. Mm. Makes a huge difference in your display. Mm-hmm. There's one thing I wanted to touch back on on documentation too, and I should have said this earlier, but and I didn't, but it just popped into my head now, and that is um, sometimes doing copies of your documentation is going to be heinously expensive, particularly if it's really long, like if you're doing a research paper or something of that nature, or uh, if there's a lot of color pictures in there. So one of the get arounds with that is, um, first of all, if if it's principality or kingdom level, um, the judges get the documentation ahead of time. So you can send them color PDF of the thing and say, here it is. On the day, have at least one color copy there that they can look at, but the rest could be just black and white photographs as far as I'm concerned at that point in time. But as long as there's, if the color is really, really important for your, whatever it is, like if you're doing a project on dyeing, color is going to be really important. So, um, but that's going to get really expensive. So just as a, for instance, uh, I have a class I teach, which is Color Theory 101 for scribes and, and uh, illuminators. Um, and it's like 70 slides long and it's all full color. And when I teach that class in person, I am not making copies of that because it's going to be heinously expensive, but I do make it available if, the, if it wants to be looked at, so. You could so probably actually fun. even um <laughs> it's probably cheaper to go and buy a bunch of cheap thumb drives and hand yeah. those out instead yeah it really was i mean it doesn't help people on the day to look at it but it, yeah when it's 70 pages long full color mm, sorry yeah but yeah so if you're going into a competition um and you know that the judges are getting your documentation ahead of time you can provide the color copies to them there have one at least on hand on the day um and then if uh, all, the rest of that you can do is as black and whites. I mean, does, does Kiva or, or Guido who've been through this and, and yourself, Kushag, have I, um, opinion on I, that? I've not, I've never entered. Mm. I, uh, I always bring my iPad with me, which has all the documentation people have sent me on there and queued up before yeah. I go to the, uh, their table. So mm -hmm. if they send me a color copy, then they don't have to give me a color copy at the table because I already right. have it with me. I try to yeah. be as organized as possible and have everything sort of lined up in the order that I need it. Yeah, anything you can do, like this is to the judges though, anything you can do to help the entrant, um, even just to that tiny little stress of, I don't have to bring color copies of everything. I mean, it may seem small, but it's really a big thing. Kiva? Um, yes, now it, it used to be that you wouldn't give copies ahead of time. And I'm glad, I'm so glad that they do, that they give the judges that week. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would check in leading up to that week. If like, so let's say on the table, we're talking about a full entry at Kingdom. I would touch base with my, with probably with Gala. Do my, do any of my judges need documentations on Saturday? Right. Yes or no? If the answer is no, I would still bring copies for royalty, at least two, if not three copies for royalties, and one copy that was on the table in color with do not remove, and that yeah. stays with your documentation at all time. And if it's a full entry, I would bring a full set for Sunday, if yeah. I can, if I'm not, um, if I was able to, and if not, I would have it in some kind of digital form, but I could have it for the Sunday judges. Um, yeah. Yeah. I usually, I mean, I try and tell people to, to bring five copies again, these yeah. be five copies, um, a, because there's going to be some judges who don't bring it with them. Um, and we'll need something to refer to. And because sometimes they tend to wander away is throughout the day. And if you have like the king and queen come and visit you and exactly. are you really going to be like tackle them and like be like, I need those <laughs> Sorry, back. Sorry, you can have that. Um, yeah, <laughs> like, and, and 
<laughs> and if you're one of those full entries who is going on to Sunday, yeah. you need those copies for Sunday. And so I always tell, tell people too, is like, if you happen to be one of those people going on on Sunday, feel free to ask for those documentation back from your judges if you need to. Yeah. But also there's usually most hotels nowadays have um, printing on site too. So if you're really in a pinch, we can probably figure something out. So yeah. whatever's going to cause you the least amount of stress. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So really, because really we want this to be a positive experience for everybody. And so, you know, the, the least amount of stress we can, uh, or as much stress as we can alleviate, we try to, which is part of the reason why I try to be really communicative with people who are entering to on, you know, what's available to them. Um, etc. I was just thinking, so. does anyone, has anyone here not been to a Kingdom ANS or is wondering what we mean when we talk about the Saturday and the Sunday? Is that something worth going over? I was just thinking question. that. Sure. Do, do, I, like, do, I have do, to. Do principality as well or just get just a kit this kingdom? No, this is just a kingdom thing. Kingdom um, is two days. Yeah. So again, when I entered, I did not know that it was two days. <laughs> Are you out of here, Guido? Yeah, I thought I could go. Okay. Good oh, night. that was an amazing class. You did a really good yeah. job. Thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Awesome. Um, yeah, so when I entered Kingdom, I did not know that it was two days. Um, and I was entering Kingdom Bardic, not ANS, but they're both, at that time, they were the same. Um, actually, they still are the same now. But anyway, um, yeah, so what happens is Saturday is the main day of competition, and everybody presents their stuff all on Saturday. At Kingdom, what they do then is they distill that down to the top two, maybe three entrants, depending on what their scores were like. If the scores are very close, you may end up with three. Um, otherwise, if the scores are not really close, you may only have two. But those two or three people then go on to a second day of competition, at which point they present one of the pieces that they presented the day before. Um, this time, however, it's in front of a panel of five judges and the king and queen and the rest of the populace. So, um, no but <laughs> yeah, no pressure, but there are no judging forms for that day. Your scores from the day before don't count anymore. You're starting from fresh. Um, and that day is more about um, your teaching and ambassadorship because that's a lot of what you're gonna be doing as champion if you were to win as being an ambassador to people for ANS or Bardic, whichever it is that you have entered. Um, and so it's more about teaching people about this thing you know, being a good ambassador for this thing you know. Um, and of course, having you know the depth and breadth of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's a different kind of competition um, than, than the day before. The day before to me is, is the high stress day. Yeah. The second and, you know, day is like- None of the judges are the same from the day before. Generally, I mean, there might be one or two that are same, but you have to understand that there's different judges for each person on, on Saturday too. So, so there may be some overlap here and there, and it may just sometimes be that this person is presenting a thing that is uh, specific to this particular, like this particular Laurel has this knowledge and they're the only here one I would, who does. I was a judge, it, it was, to they managed to have totally completely different judges on yeah this. if we can we try but oftentimes it doesn't happen that way it also depends like who's going to be there sunday because a lot of people particularly for kingdom um they're taking off to drive home right so i gotta choose <laughs> from who's going to be around as well um, but generally they're mostly laurels on that panel um unless there's specifically someone who has um vast knowledge but is not necessarily a laurel like the year that i was on the panel and i was not a laurel at that time um or like putting elvina on the panel right yeah so and so what happens then is you present your piece uh the judges for last of a better ter lack of a better term Wizards. go off and sort of talk about um your presentation kind of thing with their majesties um and then you're the the next person will present their piece um and then they go off again and they talk about it and then between the the bunch of them will sit and talk and it literally it comes down to who do they think is going to be the best ambassador of the comp uh, those competitors whether there's two or three um and in the case of when they really truly cannot decide who is going to be better then they will look at the scores from the day before um and that might factor into things although i haven't seen that happen in quite some time it's usually um they they managed somehow to figure out how last year was hard um because they had two entries that were just both of them were amazing um and so they had a little bit more kind of a hard time 
deciding between the two. I think I wasn't involved in that part of it last year. Um, and I think, as I recall, it came down to what their scores were at the end. So, yeah, so it just depends. It's a different kind of day of competition. It's, um, like I said, not about scores. It's not about, um, it's not even about the, because the judges are going to ask you questions and it's going to be much the same questions you probably had the day before. Um, but at this point, you have to understand that this is about teaching the judges, teaching their majesties, teaching the populace that are all sitting listening to this uh, and whatnot. And then they're always going to ask you, why do you want to be the, the, the Kingdom ANS champion? Or what, what do you want to do as Kingdom ANS champion? And this is just trying to glean from you who's going to be the best ambassador. It's really what it comes down to. <laughs> Anything you want to add to that, Kiva? Um, no, I panel, think, so. I think, yeah, it's, it's a very different goalpost on the Saturday versus the Sunday. Saturday is a much more technical marathon and Sundays you can let loose a little bit more, but you're sort of also like how social you can be. And, uh, it, it's a pretty fun competition. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention though, is that obviously this is being recorded and then it'll go up on the baronial. We have a new YouTube channel and you're allowed, like, this is your talk. You put it wherever you want. But you will have it as a record that hopefully we can direct more people towards. Cool. Um, so you won't have to keep giving this talk. You can be like, watch, <laughs> watch, watch my video. <laughs> you know, I, I I know that there's a Kingdom uh, YouTube channel. That might be a good place to put it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I didn't even know there was a Kingdom YouTube channel. Yeah, there should... is. There may actually be a Kingdom ANS YouTube or a, a Kingdom Ithra channel coming soon. So. Oh wow. Um, yeah, because that be, should we for that kind of thing, would that be the kingdom social media officer that we yes. would connect with? Okay, yes. that might be an idea to a cross post. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, uh, we're we're sort of reviving Ithra at right now, but oh, because, because we're in COVID, right? Uh, everything looks different than it would normally, mm -hmm. um, and so obviously the online uh, component of ANS is much more important right now than it has ever been before. Um, but those of us who are sort of in the ANS office, office and involved with ITHRA, et cetera, all feel like that even when COVID is gone away, if it ever does go away, that the online content of ANS stuff should not go away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we no, plan to continue um, posting videos anytime we do at ITHRA online in particular. We will post um, the, the videos from those classes if we're allowed to do so. Um, or if people are teaching classes on their own, like say with Disa, who's been doing all of her stuff and whatnot, um, and various other people, Gwen the Potter, and lots of people have been doing videos of various mm -hmm. kinds. Yeah, um, Gwen's, Gwen's video has been great. I've been watching those. Yeah, yeah lots and lots of people. Um, Elwis the Draper, I think her name is, does the weaving and whatnot. She has a whole pile of weaving videos on her oh. personal channel. But yeah, like we just, we think that that, that stuff should stay forever. Um, and we're trying to figure out a way to um, also give Ithra credit if that's wanted um, for the videos and whatnot, even if you've watched it, it's not live anymore, et cetera, et cetera. But, so we're still trying to work out how that's going to work, but yeah. yeah. Um, I just think it's too valuable a tool for it to, to go away forever. And mm -hmm. uh, so we're I trying to figure like out. To I'd like to know things for Ithra classes. Sorry, I heard two people at once, so I didn't hear either one. I like the longer time frames for ITHER classes, the two hour and four hour formats. Yes. Cause yeah. you get, you, you, it's um, a one hour, it's a quick dip at the trot and it's so superficial. Yep. You can't get to the meat of things. Yeah. And this really l lends itself to that you, you can do a part one, part two, part three, um, and they're going to be up there for forever. So you can watch them on your own time um, when, you know, uh, um, and still get credit for ITHRA too. Um, of course, that's going to be on your honor, um, but yeah. <laughs> and I saw Tanique had a question to you, and then after Tanique oh. is Kiva. <laughs> I've got to actually oh. head up. The kids are awake, so oh. I'll see everyone next week. All right, good night. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I saw your hand up, Tanique. Did you have something to say? Yeah, no, I was just going to say that that I would like to see that happen for Tudor as well. And um, I sort of mentioned it to Jacqueline and haven't, re but I, but I have a couple of sort of. Um, um, Tutor stuff in the works for Lionsgate and um, was hoping to, to yeah, connect you, to people who are more technically savvy than I am. <laughs> hey, Jure. Um, 
Um, yeah, no, we've actually been talking to Tudor as well um, and having them sort of talk uh, as far as Ithra goes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know what that's going to look like between the two of us, but we're, we're trying to figure out how to integrate the two mm -hmm. um, so that your Tudor credits will also count for Ithra as well. Um, and, uh, and again, with the online con content, et cetera, too. So how, how we can integrate those two, because right now they're completely separate. And that to me just doesn't make sense. Thierry is still part of Ontier. So <laughs> it seems to me that those credits should count for Ithra as well. So, um, and, and one of the other big changes too, is that the Ithra is, is now actually going to be under the ANS off office as a deputy position. Um, so we can sort of just over, oversee everything. So. I'm trying to which right now it's not. Back in Sorry, what was that? Pusha? I'm trying to remember where it used to be. I think it may have been under ANS at one point. Is it? it no, it apparently um, Amanda, when she said when she created Ithra, she specifically wanted it completely separate from the ANS office. So it's always been completely separate from the ANS oh. office, which well, does was, not make it, sense. When it was created here in in um, on tier, in on tier, it was also, different. It was also um, concurrently in West. Ah, interesting. Back yeah. In, so when Tudor, it created, when it was created, we were still part of the West. Yes. Right. Yeah. So it has been, uh, at least for as long as I've been playing, um, it's been separate and nobody could quite figure out why. <laughs> so when we decide, or let me rephrase that. When I threw Ithra under the bus back in September, cause I said, Hey, we're going to do a grand Ithra. And they all went, what? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it was at that point I was like, so why is this not under the ANS office? And because uh, like I'm the ANS minister and I had zero knowledge of who the Ithra chancellor was. None. And I asked around and nobody had any idea who the Ithra chancellor was. So I was like, yeah, so maybe we should figure all this out and kind of just consolidate things. So we are currently working on new websites, new database, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to be all new and shiny and squeaky and fantastic. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm also not in charge. <laughs> So you can afford to be excited. Yes, yes. I'm really good at throwing out ideas and then going, so who wants to do that? Um, no, uh, Viscount Seamus is actually, I think, probably going to end up being the first chancellor of this new iteration of, of Ithra. Oh, um, and he's he's really good at his job as far like he's kingdoms, or sorry, summits ANS minister right now. He does all of the, well, he has in the past done all of the classes for like Gulf War and things like that. So he's really good at at coordinating people and getting things together and running ans and ans is totally his geek so yeah he would be great assuming he you are you are plan. absolutely certain there is no current chancellor right there is no current chancellor and there is uh, <laughs> I, I know who it was well. <laughs> yeah i know who it was and there's an issue there that i had to deal with um there is currently right now no if the chancellor i'm hoping seamus is going to take the job so yes yeah <laughs> Fun and exciting uh, things. All right. There is a tail behind there somewhere. There is, and I can't really go into it. I'm sorry. Now, right? yes. Yeah. Um, it is, however, nine o'clock, so we have managed to chew up two whole hours. <laughs> Amazing. If anybody has any other questions, please feel free to ask. I did post my uh, email in the chat list, but it's probably way far up there now. Um, and I will post the link here again. As per your request, I. Mm -hmm. uh, I did post the link to the site that discusses oh, those citations, but I also, there's a chart on that site that I found that really breaks it down make and defines what you're going to see mm. when you do, oh, when, you, when you're reading that. Gotcha. And that chart just light bulbs when can you, uh, can you throw the link, if it's a separate link, can you throw the link to that chart up? in the chat as well i please. did already yes okay good thank you uh, most of the links are going to go up into um into the youtube video as well cool um there is one website and i wish i could think of the name of it maybe uh, so basically it's a take your documentation or research paper or whatever it is you happen to be writing essay uh throw it up into this thing and it will go through the entire thing and go oh you need to cite this this is so and so oh you need to cite this here you should reformat that blah um it's a valuable tool and i wish i could remember the name of it 
It's not something like turn it in, is it? <laughs> mm, no, but is that something similar? Oh, yeah, it is. Turn Very it similar. In, uh, okay. Turn it in. Like, turn it okay. in. Yeah. It's essentially a, a site that um, instructors can use mm. for papers to make sure that they haven't been plagiarized. Enough. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. If anybody thinks of the name of that thing, please let me know because it's really bugging me now. Um, anyway, that's all I have to say, unless other people have questions. And um, yeah. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. You're very, very welcome. And yeah, I'm so glad. I, you never know when you do these things, whether Great or not job. it's going to be valuable for people or not. So. Great job. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yay. Yay. Thank you to Kitter who sat through all this the whole time. <laughs> I'm going to go and. Yeah, well, hey. Have this stuff done. Thank you so much. Maybe I'll enter. Bye. Actually, I entered one, but that was in the space of about 10 minutes. Somebody said, hey, you should enter that armor you made that you're wearing. I went, uh, OK. <laughs> yes, yes, you're, yes, Your Excellency Margaret. Um, right? <laughs> Exactly. I will admit, I have had a couple of com of um, competitions that I've entered and lost, but I don't mind losing because the judges took an hour and a half to come to a decision that should have only taken them 15 minutes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. That was, yeah, uh, that, well, and, and as I said, like I said, I, I entered Bardic, Kingdom Bardic, uh, well, four times in total, uh, plus one single entry. Um, and it wasn't until the fourth time that I finally actually won the competition. So uh, for me, it was a learning experience each time. And so each time I came back and um, yeah, so. I know that one of the things that has kept me away from, from that kind of competition, you know, other than the fact that I wasn't available to serve as a yeah. champion. And that is a big consideration. If you can't serve, you don't enter. Yeah, that's yeah. given. Um, but a couple of the things had, a, had as part of the of the outline of the competition, that part of the judging was a populace's choice, and that was basically you had to do you know, the the let's let's get something that you can really include the populace in. I'm going, um, that's not the kind of music I'm presenting. Right. <laughs> my my pieces would go <laughs> like that. <laughs> Yeah, and it, and I have some I have some strong feelings on that. Trust me, uh, particularly because they changed the format of Bardic. It's no longer um, like the A and S competition anymore. So now it is much more a popularity contest. Um, yeah, which, as you said, for some people that would be great, and for other people not so much. So um, it's kind of like it's gone from being. Yeah. Folk, 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 folk. mom you need to do this they're going to be short on people they need people folk, 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 folk. i'm going yeah well you know that nana's gone perhaps i could but yeah yeah it, it's very much gone from the the academic side to a performance side um and uh, without going into all the details of the whole controversy i personally would like to see a melding of the two yeah. Um, and so I'm hoping maybe we can move to that as opposed to one or the other. Um, because, yeah. you know, a, a, a strong, a strong academic performance in period style with, you know, is not necessarily going to appeal to the populace. Right. Well, and doesn't and necessarily I'm, mean you can perform either. Right. So yeah. it's and one I'm thing to play music. To denigrate, um, the sort of songs we did like Lionsgate, right? Which I've been performing for 40 odd years now. Mm. Um, and, and that's a part of our SCA history. It's it's still, that sort of music is also needed. Yep. Well, and that's why I say, I'd like to see a melding of the two. Like I don't wanna see the academic side of research, et cetera, et cetera, because that's important, go away, which right now it kind of does. Um, and so it's gone It's gone from the shift of, of trying to be period um performing period pieces to specifically i just want to be entertaining i just want to sing pretty songs and entertain people um and i think we need to have a melding of those two because i mean as far as, as a bardic laurel for one i really want to see that kind of stuff so but i also want to be entertained so yeah yeah and that's not to say that period stuff isn't entertaining like there's a that lot is true yes 
There's yes. some of it that's not to my taste, but other people love it. And there's right. stuff that I love that other people can't stand. So, well, for instance, I love Shakespeare, but I know there's a lot of people out there who Shakespeare puts them right to sleep. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, depends. Uh, do you well, find I, Shakespeare I entertaining? I Shakespeare side. <laughs> Right. Do you find it Shakespeare entertaining? Great. Those of you who don't are not going to be impressed by that. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I personally, like I said, I would like to find a melding of the between the two. Um, like, for instance, right now, it's it's, as I said, you have one piece that you're allowed 500 words of documentation and that's it. Uh, one piece that doesn't have to be documented at all, um, but still has to be period. Those two pieces have to be period or plausibly period. And then the third piece is strictly for entertainment, can be anything you want, doesn't have to be period, uh, et cetera. So maybe, like I said, having one piece that is fully documented, one piece that's whatever you want to do, and then maybe one that's in between. I don't know. Just well, it's through making sure that, that everybody, that uh, the person can basically perform in all of those venues right. too. Right, well-rounded. Well-rounded, yeah. yeah. I could see that point. Yeah, anyway, that's my personal rant. I mean, I can go on for days about this, but <laughs> and I have. I'm sure Elspeth is sitting down there going, oh, I know. <laughs> yes, yes, she can. <laughs> oh. well, yeah, we can yeah. all put people to sleep with our passions, right? <laughs> that's true. That's true. I mean, I can talk about cow calling till the cows come home, but not everybody's going to care. <laughs> We, at Collegium, as a group, did enter um, a bardic competition at, um, it was a, a Bitter Waters War mm -hmm. um, for a period piece in which I had basically, I'd written, written it in period style. And uh, yeah, you can ask uh, Brianna about it. She was one of the judges. Mm -hmm. And it was the, it was the, we perform it and there's polite golf applause. Mm right right and then you know brianna's looking at me going you are a sick sick twisted woman and everybody looked at her and going what the heck and then she read them out the translations right of the texts i'd used which were mcbean chants <laughs> nice nice and you know, the, you know who says one. you can't have fun <laughs> it's true style well, one positive thing I will say about the current Kingdom Bardic um, parameters is that it does open it up for completely original work. So, because the, the old way we used to do things, there was no leeway for that either. It could be original, but it had to be original in a period style, um, or it had to be a period piece done in a more original style, like, but there was nothing for completely original poetry or completely original music or any of those kinds of things. So this, this competition does open it up for that because that third piece that doesn't have to be period can be anything you want. So it can be something you've written. So for instance, that's what I entered was a piece that oh, I, oh, I wrote. What I, what I wrote was totally in period style. Oh yeah, I, I get that. I get that. But it, like for, for say my apprentice Brintak, uh, who mostly writes his own completely non-period music, yeah. he has no place in the competition, in the old competition. In this competition, he does. So it does open it up for people um, that are on that side. But like I said, I would like to see a sort of a more of a blend of the two. Um, but that's my opinion and other people have other opinions and that's okay too. <laughs> uh, dear. Anyway, yeah, okay well thank you everyone thank yes you. thank you very much your excellency hey, don't forget to be send me those measurements yes, and I'm sorry what all right <laughs> i'll get that thank you i gotta find my shield though to do that so yeah i can do that <laughs> yes all good all right. thank you good night. thank you guys good night, good night. everyone <laughs>